If I ask you to imagine a children's feature animation, what probably comes to mind is bright colours, CG animation. An obvious antagonist, a clear central conflict, a story arc, and within that perhaps an individual character arc or character arcs for the main protagonists. I want you to take all of that, screw it up, throw it out of the window, and what you're left with is a very different film, and one that I find better than almost any feature animation since. This is Hayao Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro. This is a film conceived as a film without a central conflict. This is a film without an antagonist. This is a hand-drawn animation from 1988 with a relatively muted palette. And for me, as I've said, it is one of the best animations I've ever seen. I still have a massive amount of affection for it. I first encountered my neighbour Totoro back in 1998, 1999. I was shown it on VHS. This was in a Chinese dub with Chinese subtitles, so my friend had to talk me through some of the details of what was happening. I probably then didn't see it for a, a few years until it would have been in Blockbuster, probably in the American version where it was called My, Na My Friend Totoro, and then it would have been a couple of years after that, maybe 2006 or later, when I finally got hold of a DVD of it for myself. And throughout that period it's remained very dear and very important to me. And there are several reasons for this, which I'll go into later. So, recently when Home in Manchester were running a Studio Ghibli season, which is still currently ongoing, and as part of that there were two showings of My Neighbour Totoro, I knew I had to get on to see it. As far as I can remember, I haven't seen it on the big screen previously. So I went along on Thursday and fell in love with it all over again and was much more immersed given that it was on this huge, huge screen right in front of me. For me there are lots of reasons why My Neighbour Totoro is one of my favourite films. The two major ones are the fact that it's a film without conflict, without really much in the way of a plot, and also the way that nature is, is portrayed within it. So I'll, I'll begin with the first of those, that lack of a central conflict, that lack of an antagonist, that lack of a story arc. The story itself, to just get that out of the way, is very simple. Uh, two young girls, Satsuki and her sister May, move with their father to a dilapidated house on the edge of the forest, overlooked by an enormous camphor tree. The girl's mother is currently in hospital. She's recovering from what is most likely TB. Um, and very little happens. They move to the new house, they talk to the neighbours, the girls go and visit their mother, the father does some work, Satsuki goes to school, May gets upset, and they encounter forest spirits, they encounter the titular Totoro. And that's more or less what happens. And really your conventional critical wisdom will tell you that shouldn't work. That is, isn't how you make a film. You need strong story arcs, strong character arcs. You need a central conflict. You need to develop from point A to point B. Not necessarily. I, don't, I really don't think you do. I think there are a lot of films that tell stories in interesting and compelling ways without having that. And this is a prime example of it. It's specifically conceived as a film without that central conflict. And the lives and the concerns of these girls are compelling enough in themselves. Their mother is ill, they don't properly understand what's going on. They're in a new place. This seems to be more troubling for the younger May than it does for Satsuki, who seems to make friends fairly quickly. But it's, it's a lot of upheaval, it's a very frightening experience, and it's something that I think we can all 
identify with. And this film really doesn't need to do anything beyond that. Uh, an antagonist wouldn't fit in this story. A central conflict might fit in the, in the story, but it, it, it wouldn't make the film any better. It would set it on a particular set of rails which would allow it to do less of what it does very well. And one of those things, of course, is the second of these two big things which I love about the film, which is the portrayal of nature. Like most others I can remember being a child, I can remember encountering nature in the natural world and, and spending hours lying down, staring into sunbeams, watching dust motes uh, fly on my face, sitting on a wall by a field, watching as wind blew the grasses and as they sort of rushed from wall to wall like big green armies. And this film captures that very well. The, the movement of trees blown by the wind, the movement of grasses blown by the wind, the portrayal of, of nature and also the, the way that light and, and, and different lighting conditions are captured uh, are, are tremendously well done both in the backgrounds and in the foreground animation. Uh, I mentioned the, the colour palette and the different lights. One of the things that I noticed on this viewing on the big screen which I can't remember having consciously noticed was how in evening and nighttime scenes the images are much simpler. The trees are rendered with less detail. And they're in greys, in much darker colours. So everything is a lot simpler. You still get the idea the outline is there, the movement is the same. But it doesn't have the same detail as, as daytime. And for me, that it's more natural, it's more true to how we see things. It felt more like, like the experience of, of, of watching trees blow at, at night than something CG where you would still have perhaps all that detail. It would just be muted down. This stripped out all that detail and that, that's very much to, to its benefit. And it, it's indicative of the kind of intelligence and thought that's gone into the animation right through. Um, I mentioned remembering as a, as a child seeing grasses blowing. That's, that's still in my mind now when I go out into nature, when I go for walks, when I look at beauty. So also is, is my neighbour Totoro. Whenever I see big copses of trees, big strands of trees, tall trees, trees blowing in the wind, I, I imagine I imagine Totoro, I imagine these, these wood spirits being there. I, there are huge areas of Manchester where I'll, I'll wander around and I imagine Totoro might well be wandering about in there. There's, there is something magical about nature and about a child's eye view of the world which is captured brilliantly by this film. And I think by concentrating on that sort of eternal present on the, the sort of selfish fears and concerns and the immediate issues of life, the immediate excitement and the, the immediate immediately frightening aspects of whatever's happening, it captures the child's eye view. It doesn't try to take that experience and narrow it, narrow it down into conventional narrative limitations which I feel would, would make it a weaker film. And there are there are other strengths to the film. I think in common with most if not all of Miyazaki's other films, it's wonderful to have a film where there are two young female protagonists and, and where they're not they're not your conventional children's film protagonists, they're not subject of prophecy. No one has pointed a finger out of the sky and said, you are the chosen one. 
And they don't even have an arc where they kind of achieve a, a sort of spurious greatness through this forced conflict. They are just ordinary children. They're much closer to the audience than cartoon characters normally are, than characters in, in, in films generally normally are. They have an identifiable experience, they have identifiable reactions. We see the film through their eyes because it's how we've seen similar experiences, whether we've seen Blood Spirits or not. And despite this, it's not it's not a universally sunny film. It's not it's it's it, it is a film which has compelling moments and which keeps your interest. There's an ambiguity. The new house might be haunted. There are dark rooms. There are things that are scary initially. There's the girls concerned for their mother's health. They're worried about she might die. She might not come home. And on top of that, there, there's May getting lost. She might have drowned. She hasn't, obviously, spoilers. Um, so there are moments of darkness and fear, but they're not generated by forced conflict, which then has to be resolved by violence or by some equally bogus means. And, and there's no antagonist. It's just a complete world in itself. And for me that's what makes it a very powerful experience. And having said all this and having actually spent very close to an hour and a half and something like 15 different aborted recordings trying to get this review done. There's not really a great deal uh, for me to say about about the film. It's it's not a film to talk about critically, I don't think. It's a film to see and watch and experience and and love. And it's a very short film. It you know, it doesn't drag on forever because it doesn't have this uh, invented conflict, it doesn't have antagonists, it doesn't have this, this story arc, the character arc, it doesn't have all these conventional beats that ordinary filmmaking and the kind of critical consensus tells you you need to have. It tells a very simple story, a very nice story about characters that you care about, and then it ends. And I would recommend you go and see it if you haven't. And if you get a chance to see it on a big screen, then absolutely you, you must go. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.